Lon, L-O-N-N, M as I used to put on my monikers writing for rock and roll. Friend, F-R-I-E-N-D. My first real job in the magazine business I was hired on April 19, 1982 and was associate editor position at Larry Flint Publications. I originally came in to interview for the opening at Gentleman's Companion, one of the sister publications. But going through the interview process that day, I was clueless. I had had a job as a publisher's assistant at Gambling Times magazine but I didn't do much but kind of shuffle papers and get to know how a magazine worked. It wasn't an editorial gig. This was my first real editorial job. So it was a bit of a baptism by fire for me because I was 26, 25, 26 years old and I was making $17,500 a year and I had an office in the 2029 Century Park East Tower. The towers that are on the cover of Yes is Going for the One LP. <laughs> In 1987, when Althea Flint's health was failing, she had planted a seed inside the company. It was really 86 th that she wanted a rock and roll magazine. There was a concept for a magazine called Rage, which was fashion, it was very punk rock like Althea was. But that Rage never saw fruition. But as she, her health was failing and, and I was coming near the end of my hustler tenure because I was sort of getting bored. I was like the creative director and I, I was doing this piece. My swan song article was about Colleen Applegate who was a porn star named Shauna Grant who blew her brains out because she got mixed up in the wrong, the wrong people. She is the classic fallen angel story who came from the Midwest pure white bread, perfect skin, perfect figure, gets tied up with the cocaine hustlers and porn and pff, tragic end. So after that piece runs, I guess my soul sort of kind of is like going out and there's this magazine that we have started in the, inside called Rip Magazine. And, I, and I, I went into the CEO's office, Jim Coles, I said, you know, I'm, this Rip Magazine, what's happening with that? It was in like the seventh issue. He goes, not much. They had a copy editor who turned into the editor-in-chief named Michael Levine who was, was doing a good job of capturing sort of the punk and metal dichotomy that was very visible at that time in music. But I said, I'd like to take over the rip if, if that's okay. Just give me really good graphics and let me do it my way. And I had established a credibility because of Hustler. And Chic, which I became executive editor of, did a music column for Chic called Music Notes. So I'd started relationships inside the music world, but my pitch was just let me take rip. Now, I'm not the one who created the celestial alignment known as Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. That was not my doing. It just so happened that the summer I took over, the, the, the staff that I hired people, the freelancers, the photographers, the writers around Hollywood all knew about this band and were hanging out with this band. The guys that came from Indiana and the ones that were local because they were the perfect hybrid Guns N' Roses. There was Axel and Izzy, the late Wes Arkeen, Shannon Hoon, there was the, the Indiana contingent and then there was the Hollywood Rose, the Tracy Gunn, Slash, Steven Adler, the LA contingent, and the collision was whoo, which Vicki Hamilton discovered to them, took the tape to Tom Zutat, Geffen Records, Appetite for Destruction, the rest is history. Well, here's the, this is the interesting thing about um, my personal journey. Coming out of Hustler Magazine, I had this sense of legitimacy with the hard rock heavy metal community from my sheer proximity to the decadence and the debauchery. And when these bands would come up and I started to establish the friendships, I would give them packages of porn. 
magazines, videos to take with them. And they would, they would come up to the office, and because Rip was inside at that time, the Hustler offices, I'd walk them into the photo department and show them the layouts. And, I mean, Richie Sambora, John Bon Jovi, Paul Stanley, Steven Tyler, Nikki Six, Tommy Lee, all these guys visited me then. Plus, we were doing the NAM show from 88, 89, and we were having booths where the rockers came over, and I'd send girls out wearing ripped t-shirts. So there was this, this, I guess, a synergy of sin, yet, at the same time, when I inherited RIP and started to develop it as, as a legitimate magazine. I believed that the heavy metal community was being under, underserved, almost insulted by other publications who were running redrafted press releases, less than robust profiles, photographs that were all live and not studio composed. So my my favorite magazine then in that transition was Kerrang! magazine and I looked at Kerrang! and I said this this magazine knows how to cover this genre. The Brits to me have always been the shit because you know I grew up on British music. If you go back to what I love most when I, when I was seven years old I bought Meet the Beatles the day after the Ed Sullivan show and then it was the Kinks and the Who and Pink Floyd and Genesis and all those groups they were English I mean, that, that land was so enchanted to me. So the magazine, I like this, America Needs a Kerrang. So Rip became, and, and a little bit of Rolling Stone in that I was un, in an unprecedented fashion requesting, not demanding, but requesting exclusive photo sessions for groups. But I also paid the artists back for the access by running double page opening articles that were so visually stunning. That's what anybody of that era who, who was in RIP Magazine, those artists, artists like Soundgarden and Poison and Guns N' Roses, and they'll remember that we, we paid such good attention to making them look bigger than life. So I think it's, I was just lucky that I came out of a scandalous pedigree, so they trusted me, you know. In fact, the, really the story that I wrote about in my first book, uh, Life on Planet Rock, which Lars wrote the foreword to when I asked him, will you write the foreword to my first book? I thought I'd be honored, but can, can you not edit it? Just let it be my words. Sorry. In 1987, I went to the Rainbow, the Roxy, just to kind of get out onto the street and get to know people as I had just taken over RIP Magazine in like the fall of 87. And I'm standing there in front of the Roxy and there's Lars and James. And I recognized them because I, you know, I wasn't the Metallica fan from Kill 'Em All. This was a new genre to me. I did have Black Sabbath's first record. I had Judas Priest, I had those albums, but I wasn't a metalhead, so I had to educate myself. Plus, I had to place enormous trust in my staff because they did know. Hey, you guys are, you're Metallica. I go, I'm Lon Friend. I just took over Rip Magazine, and Lars looks up, he goes, Lon Friend, did you write that fucking article about the porn stars in Paris where fucking the blowjob on the plane. I go, yeah, I wrote that. He goes, great article. And James laughs, he goes, <laughs> let's go get a beer. And we went next door to the Rainbow and that was the beginning of my relationship with Metallica. They were, they were finishing Injustice for All in Los Angeles, mixing it, and I, I believe. And that's where it started. And then I ended up at a show in Phoenix on the tour, Injustice for All tour. And I called the article the night the editor's lights went out in Phoenix. It was Jason Newstead's homecoming. And I ended up drinking Jägermeister for the first time. It was a hazing. And that was, my, that was sort of my first heavy metal road story. And that relationship extended for decades.
I've done a lot of talking about the black record because when Rip uh, produced the making of Metallica series, it was the relationship that I had established with the band and with Cliff Bernstein and Peter Mensch from Q Prime. I pitched it as, you're going in the studio, I hear, to make a crossover, sort of groundbreaking record. And you've got Bob Rock producing, who had had great success with Motley Crue's Dr. Feelgood record. And I know because I was in the room when I heard Lars say to Tommy Lee, that fucking record sounds so big, man. And he goes, yeah, Bob Rock, man. Like, gave him a thumbs up. Not that that was the match that lit it, because a lot of stuff happens that's way out of my purview. But the sound of Dr. Feelgood was, was very much in the space of Metallica when that production choice was made. <clears throat> I, I sort of pitched it like, we just want to show up every month and check in on the production of the record and we will run segments in the magazine. And it was really my personal gig to go to one-on-one -on -one studios in North Hollywood and visit and see what was happening. And like the first four months it was, well, Lars is still doing his drum tracks. So it was getting the ambiance and the atmosphere and talking to Bob Rock and Randy, the engineer. Then as things progressed, it, there was like this one great segment that, that I remember writing where when James was miking his guitar and he showed me the tent of doom where his sound came from. And being the fact that I'm not a musician and I've always questioned whether I had the credibility to write about music because I'm not a musician and I, I can't play anything. But I come from it from a more kind of an a place of essence, a soulful place where I understand the artist's process, but not necessarily the language or the protocol or the, or, or the language. I'm more in awe of musicians than in understanding of how they do what they do. And I think that's sort of what made my voice evolve differently than other writers. I want fans to see what I see. And the fact that I had this extraordinary access was my gift back to the fans to show them places that maybe they would never be able to see. And that's what Rip did. It was a microscope into that world, a very eclectic microscope as far as the, the very variation of artists that we covered. There was an instinct amongst the band that I got a vibration that they knew they were making a record that was going to shift the rotation of the rock planet. And I think it really hit me the day that they sat me down in the studio to listen to a rough mix of Sad But True. They were all sitting there and, and they put me on the seat like I was gonna get electrocuted. I had this and James always has this sinister kind of look in his eye, like, you ready? I go, yeah. And then they played, they just, speakers just. <laughs> and I w walked out after the mix and I, I got it. I go, That's what you fuckers are doing. <sighs> Took the wind out of me. And they, they knew, I mean, the, Lars was so smart at the way Metallica evolved, how he handled media and fans and the whole band ethic, like they're underdogs, warrior underdogs, and how gradually they came into that MTV medium with, this, with the great video they made for uh, One from the uh, Johnny Got His Gun, you know, that they didn't just rush into it and do a hair ballad with wind machines. They did it Metallica's way. And that's why Black Enter Sandman just hit so hard. And the fact that that record was so deep on tracks. Now there's Metallica purists who just dismiss anything after Injustice for All. But you know, Metallica re has reinvented themselves many times. This is the S&M record, 
and, and the, of course there was the excruciating Saint Anger record, but that was a that was an EPK for press that turned into a documentary, some kind of monster. They they didn't know that they were going to fall apart as a group, that they had internal conflicts, because they really kind of wrote their own ticket all the way. And then when they hit the speed bump, boom, they turned it into a piece of art, which is what a great artist does. Black success and its numbers are, you know, it's like, it was like the biggest selling record of the 90s, of any genre. And it became one of those, like, ACDC Back in Black or Dark Side of the Moon, one of those monolith records that will sell forever. Even with the genres changing, I'm sure streams wise, it's, it's off the map. But there was an intuition and an instinct between uh, creatively with James and in a sort of a promotional global vision sense with Lars that they were stepping into new territory. And uh, that, that I believe is, is pretty true. Well, the music industry ha has been changing ever since Napster. I think the internet changed the music business. I'm not a tech person. I've never even understood how new media works or file sharing, but I knew the battles that went on. In fact, with respect to Metallica, I was the editor-in-chief of KNAC.com when, when Lars delivered petitions to the courthouse in Menlo Park up by San Francisco, effectively suing Metallica fans for file sharing. And Rob Jones and I, who's a guy who took KNAC off of Terrestrial and put it on his laptop, and we were the, really the first 24-7 hard rock streaming site, and I, I was doing all the non-broadcast content. I said, dude, let's go up to Menlo Park. I believe if we just show up and Lars sees me, we can get an exclusive. And just, let's just, he, I mean, he, he, he's a friend. I'll just ask him, what, why are you doing this? So we took a flight up and Rob, all, he, all we had with us was a laptop and a camera. We did everything from that. That was the beginnings of creating this enormously robust content with just using the tools at hand. He was a genius, Rob Jones. He could encode things and edit things. And by evening, whatever we did in the afternoon was up for all of the, all of the fans to see on the website. So we show up and there's this courthouse and a podium in front of the courthouse. And Lars's cameras are there. It's like MTV cameras. And he's made a statement and he's put these petitions down on this thing and then I'm standing there like I'm a fan in the crowd and I'm like and he sees me and he goes like this like wait so we hang we wait we sit in a van and Lars comes out come gets in the van I go dude this is Rob from knac.com <clears throat> we want to do an interview with you like now just so you can talk to the fans he, and he said, just let me call Cliff and Peter. He, on his cell phone, he calls New York. Yeah, Lon's here. Wants to interview us. Just for KNAC fans. Okay, yeah. And then Cliff makes a couple stipulations. And he says, okay, we could do it. And we drive 10 minutes to this park. And we sit on a park bench. And it's on the internet, you can find it somewhere. It's me and Lars sitting on a bench talking about Napster and talking about his relationship with his fans. And Rob's just filming it and we edit it and put it up and it's, it's, I've never been the guy who confronts the musician about whatever he's doing in his career. I've never been the tabloid guy. I got calls every time Guns N' Roses did something wrong by Current Affair or the National Enquirer, and I hung up the phone every time because that's not the way I chose to present the artist. 
I didn't care what kind of reptilian behavior they were involved in. The fans got to see the best of them. And that's why it wasn't as successful personally, because if I chose the tabloid route, I probably would have had a lot more cash in my pocket, but I, I preferred to maintain the relationship of the artist. So to me, it was always artists first, and then the handlers and their, their family came second. But if you got the trust of the artist, that trumped everything. So that's, that day is a microcosm of how it was just because of my history with Metallica, and this is in the year 2000 now, a decade after Black and all the, you know, it's well documented in my first book, how much I traveled with Metallica on that record, being in Europe when the record goes on sale and me and Lars sitting in the room when he gets a fax that says, we're number one. You know, and then his head got all big, and that's another story. <clears throat> but um, that kind of access l lets you show fans a thing that they couldn't possibly see otherwise. And I, I wasn't going to tell them, you know, you're going to get hated by some people. He already knew he was walking on the slippery slope with his fans. When you know Metallica's history, don't sue your fans. Then the whole debate about the legitimacy of file sharing and Napster, that came later. That's not as important as the fact that I was sort of felt blessed that I got to have this conversation with them for 20 minutes in a park and then hand it off to this new technology so fans could see and get a glimpse. And so that was sort of a special time. The late 80s, there, you, you, can, you can legitimately call Sunset Boulevard between Doheny and La Cienega, or really Doheny and Sweetser. You could call it the vortex of the glam 80s metal scene. It's not that necessarily that the groups grew up around there. It's that that's where their fans started to congregate. And their fans knew that the real guys in the band would show up and get drunk at the Rainbow, and go to On the Rocks after a gig, and, and hang out in front of the whiskey, and then there were sexy girls wearing next to nothing, walking up and down the strip, handing out warrant flyers, and Dokken flyers, and Motley Crue flyers. I remember attending the Motley Crue uh, Girls, Girls, Girls listening or release party at the, at the body shop on Sunset. And I was still with Hustler because it was 1986. And all these motorcycles show up and the whole record is themed in decadence. And it was absolutely the loudest, most perfect space to be. If you're coming out with this music, the Sunset Strip was the epicenter. Now when you have MTV showing videos, all of a sudden the whole world starts to go, wait a minute, we got to go there. Now I've worked with and written bios for acts that have come along who specifically relocated from Michigan or Iowa or, or rural Illinois relocated just to Hollywood because they saw Apat they saw the Welcome to the Jungle video and they saw Axel get off the bus and they saw that this is the new country. I have a shot at that dream. I'm going there. I was I was more taken kind of because of where I came from journalistically from Hustler. I was more taken almost with Poison's Fallen Angel video. Because that girl in that video, she was from that part of the country. And she did come here and she did hook up with Brett Michaels and she did get a nose full of blow and everything went south. So it was almost life imitating art in, a, in the most unsettling way. That being said, and this is why I've been in Rock Wives documentaries and children of rock stars, is because those women chose, they chose that time 
to be the muse in the most decadent fashion. Every rocker, I didn't care if he was in a platinum band or he was in a loser band playing off the strip that had 10 fans, they all had the hottest chicks. They all did. The lead singer and the guitar player all had the hottest chicks. And if you got any glimpse of that and you were living way far from Los Angeles, you just said, hey man, I could play as, I could play as good as Tracy Guns. I'm going to LA. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna find my chick and my fans and I'm gonna go there. I don't even know that they cared about money so much. I think it was the debauchery that was more a beacon than anything else. And that's what that period was. They weren't, they weren't writing song, you know, songs that are gonna last in the poetic canon of rock history. They were writing songs about freedom. I mean, if you remember the uh, nothing but a good time video, this guy's flipping burgers. He has a shitty life. But the minute work is off, he gets into his rock wear and he goes out and he lives it. And that is, that's it in a total nutshell, why the music got so popular and why the nostalgia is so pervasive. I mean, these groups are playing festivals now. I go to the M3 in Baltimore every year and I walk around there and it's, it's, it's like a time capsule of the pages of RIP magazine because those groups, and some of them have evolved and gotten healthy, but some of them still walk around two-fisted like it's 1989. <laughs> they, they think they're immortal. So there's a sense of immortality that you get, this illusion of immortality that you get because I, I play guitar and I could drink and my liver will burst. I don't care. And so many of them die early. We know we've come through a year where so many artists are dying. But that's kind of like the trade-off. You know. I mean, Debbie Harry said, die young, stay pretty, live fast, because it won't last. 